All right, so what are microplastics? Microplastics um, are a pollutant that has emerged as an international issue of concern. They are classified as a piece of plastic between one and five, one micron and five millimeters in size. So um, invisible to the, to the naked eye up to basically at the size of a grain of rice. It's really important to think of microplastics as a suite or as a class of contaminants. It's not just this one thing. Microplastics are diverse. They come from many different products and polymer types, and they all have the shared characteristics of being non-biodegradable. They absorb and release chemicals. They fragment, but they don't disappear. And they come in different shapes, sizes, and colors, with microfibers being the most commonly found in our environment. Microplastics have been found in all of the world's oceans, from the surface to the deep ocean trenches, They've been found in freshwater environments, tap water, bottled water, a variety of beverages, agricultural soils, honey, table salt, seafood, birds, human placentas, and our air. So basically, the more places we look for microplastics, the more places we find them. So microplastics are generally divided into two different categories, and each have different regulatory aspects. The primary microplastics are plastics that have been created on the, uh, as a microplastic, so less than five millimeters in size. Uh, a common one are these nurdles. These are these little plastic resin pellets. And these are transported all around the world in big shipping containers um, and brought to manufacturing sites where they're melted down and molded into the final product. Another um, type of primary microplastics are the microbeads. And these are small spheres that are added into personal care products, such as face wash, toothpaste, sunscreens, um, as an exfoliant or a filler. And uh, microbeads are now banned in many countries around the world. Primary microplastics um, often directly enter the environment through spills, in the case of nurdles, or through household wastewater, in the case of microbeads. The secondary microplastics are the predominant type of microplastics we find in our environment. So these are small pieces of plastic that have come from larger pieces fragmenting over time um, from things such as bottles or bags or tires or textiles. This happens through mechanical and chemical degradation. Another sig really significant contributor to the secondary microplastics, or microfibers in this case, um, appear to be our clothing. So every time we wear, wash, or dry our synthetics, they shed into the environment, both into the water and into the air. So each washing machine cycle can release thousands of microfibers, resulting in a, an estimated half million tons of microplastics coming from synthetic clothing, ending up in our oceans every year. And um, just in the last couple of years, a lot more research has come out about um, drying um, synthetics as well. If you think about looking at your house, um, where your dryer um, uh, output is outside, there's a lot of lint around there. So this is another significant contribution that we're still just beginning to understand. So how do they make um, our, their way into our environment? Uh, point and non-point pollution sources for microfibers and microplastics are similar to other pollutants. Especially noteworthy sources are tire dust. We have to replace our tires every couple of years. Where does that rubber go? Synthetic rubber. Um, and wastewater treatment plants, and that's pre uh, predominantly fibers. Tire and roadwear particles are emitted into the environment by the thousands of tons each year. Um, we're still also just beginning to uh, better understand uh, tires as a source of microplastics. And depending on the design of a wastewater treatment plant, um, they can be an actual uh, a major source of microfibers from domestic washing through wastewater treatment plants, both the outfall and the sludge. The sludge um, from wastewater treatment plants is often landfilled or land applied, and it can contain really high numbers of microfibers. And these can get into the groundwater, run off into a watershed, or potentially become airborne. Two other sources um, that we're just beginning to, to, be, to understand and to be studied are airborne microfibers that shed while wearing our synthetic clothing. 
um, and the other potentially significant source of microfiber pollution are cigarette filters. Um, but there's because there's are usually bundles of uh, synthetic cellulose or something of the like. Um, but that's still yet to be quantified. <clears throat> okay, so it's not just the plastics, um, it's the toxins associated with plastics that is concerning. So in the aquatic environment, there are many ambient toxicants, and most of these are known as the persistent organic pollutants, or POPs. These are compounds that are resistant to environmental degradation, legacy compounds. The physical and chemical properties of these, um, pla uh, of plastics, facilitate attraction and concentration of these chemicals, sometimes up to a million magnitudes higher than the surrounding seawater. Plastics also release the hazardous additives that are made, that, that they are made with into the water. So all of these chemicals have known negative human and environmental health effects. So this tiny, seemingly insignificant piece of plastic can become a toxic sponge and transport pops and their associated additives around the world and into different habitats and animals. So unfortunately, when plastics are consumed, either directly out of the environment or indirectly through consuming a prey item that contains plastics, the toxins from and on plastic can leach into the animal and find a permanent place in the food web. We've also discovered that microplastics can move through the blood membrane barrier and enter into different body systems. Um, and uh, nanoplastics is an emerging field of research and uh, I don't know very much about it other than it's pretty disturbing um, in terms of how easy nanoplastics can move through different systems. Studies uh, have shown associated behavior change, reduced reproduction, um, energy uptake, and diminished offspring performance in animals that have ingested microplastic. Ingestion can have long-term individual, population, and community level impacts that we're still just beginning to understand. We do know that we're eating, as humans, we're eating and breathing them in about half a pound each a year and that uh, the impacts of environmental exposure to microplastics on mortality, morbidity, um, and the reproductive success of species continues to be investigated. So to put it in a slightly more local context, back in 2015, I did a food web study with a local research institute now called the Shaw Institute. We analyzed 51 mussels, um, both rope grown and wild uh, caught, oysters, clams, lobster, and mackerel. We found microplastics in 96% of the seafood species, and the average number of microplastics per gram of tissue across all the species was two and a half pieces. The lobster and the mackerel had more of the larger microplastics, so a little bit bigger, between three and a half um, millimeters to five millimeters than the bivalves. So although microplastics research has been a really fast moving field, there continues to be a lot of questions. And one of the first steps in furthering my understanding at that point was to look at how we collected and quantified microplastics in the marine environment. And I put this slide up not as a deterrent to eat seafood. I think that we're probably breathing in as much microplastic as we are eating, which isn't really heartening, but. <laughs> um, so uh, the, the first sort of uh, field research I did was to conduct a field comparison on two different sampling techniques. Uh, the paper that we, we published demonstrates that the traditional and most often used technique for sampling microplastics, which is the surface um, plankton net, the bottom right hand corner, gave a density estimate for microplastics that was three orders of magnitude lower than the grab sampling technique, which is just using a bottle of water and scooping up um, a uh, liter um, of surface water. So relying solely on the Neuston Toast samples would have resulted in a gross underestimation of the amount of microplastics in the sea surface. Also, I really like the grab sample technique, even though it's just a small amount of water, it really easily lent itself to citizen science because it was really easy to build in quality control measures, which we, we realized, um, we have realized more and more um, throughout the years that uh, the sampler can contaminate the sample very easily. Um, the, I was able to develop a very simple protocol and the equipment is much more affordable. The tone nets um, range 
range over $1,500 each, and you have to also have a boat to tow them with. So now that I had a solid methodology, I wanted to learn more about the sources, composition, and distribution of microplastic pollution in oceans, rivers, lakes, and streams worldwide. So at this point um, in 2013, I approached and partnered with Adventure Scientists, which is a nonprofit organization based in Bozeman, Montana. We launched the Global Marine Microplastics Initiative, and in 2015, we expanded into global freshwater environments and also began a two-year study in the Gallatin watershed in Montana. They primarily managed the citizen scientists, and I ran all other aspects of the project. At the project's conclusion, we made a short video that will explain a little bit more about the organization and the project. So I'm going to um, play this for you. Five years ago, we scooped up a half liter of water locally, brought it back to the Institute, looking under the microscope and seeing all these technicolor pieces of plastic led me to think of all of these larger questions. How is it affecting the ocean? Our drinking water, our microplastics everywhere, but I couldn't answer those on my own. So this is when I partnered with adventure scientists. Adventure Scientists is a nonprofit organization that unites explorers and scientists to solve some of the world's most pressing environmental issues in which access to data is crucial to resolving them. I worked with adventure scientists to train adventurers who would be collecting data for me around the world. Able to get water samples from the Antarctic and the middle of the Pacific. We're going to send this in to the labs. Through the process of working with adventure scientists, I was getting closer to understanding the magnitude of this issue. After analyzing thousands of samples from around the world, we concluded that 74% of them contain microplastic pollution. Microplastics are one of the largest pollution problems that you've never seen. Without adventure scientists, I would have never been able to even dream about this breadth of data that I've been able to collect. The adventure scientist model lends itself to so many different projects, whether it be microplastics or forestry conservation or animal protection. This is just the beginning. Based on survey res results, 80% of our volunteers uh, that participated in this project have taken steps to address plastic or microplastic pollution in their own communities. And we're really proud of this because that's sort of the, the whole point of engaging um, a wider, wider group of people. So this is um, a map showing where one liter grab surface samples were collected by an adventure scientist. The size of the bubble indicates the quantity of plastic um, that was collected in that sample. And the color, so the orange um, bubbles show samples that contain plastic and the yellow um, means that they did not contain plastic. And that's actually really important as well. One, not just to find samples that don't contain plastic, but also to know that our protocol was robust enough that um, the samplers weren't always contam weren't contaminating samples. Uh, we collected over 2,400 samples. About, about 1,400 of those were from the marine environment and um, over 1,000 from freshwater. About 90% of the microplastics we found were microfibers. Uh, 
and the majority of those were invisible to the naked eye, so about less than 1.5 millimeters in size, which is a smaller size than those captured in the majority of service studies to date. We produced this publication, which covered five years of marine research, um, conducted in partnership with adventure scientists. And it was really important for me to have the data peer reviewed in order to validate the research in the wider world and increase its impact. All of the data collected with adventure scientists is open source, available through their website, and as are the um, lab and field methods. So for the marine findings in brief, as I said, we collected about 1,400 samples from every ocean on the planet, including coastal environments and understudied ocean regions. The data showed that microplastic concentration is higher in the open ocean than along the coast, um, and with the highest concentrations found in the polar oceans, which has now been further validated by many other studies, um, showing that the polar regions sort of are a sink for plastics. Um, spatially, it was very diverse, um, the samples. You know, you could collect one sample and um, five minutes later collect another sample and they'd have very different um, plastic contamination levels. This is uh, a sample taken from the middle of the Atlantic Ocean and these grid lines um, are about 3.2 millimeters um, in length, just to give you a context for scale. Oh, and as, also, as you can see, there's a lot of microfibers. <laughs> so to focus on the Gulf of Maine, uh, we only unfortunately had coastal samples um, for this region, um, but they have the uh, Gulf of Maine has the second highest amount of any region in the Atlantic Ocean, second to the Caribbean. So on average, we found eight pieces of plastic per liter of water, um, and 96% of those were microfibers. And the freshwater had a much lower average of 0.5 microplastics per liter, but 100% of those were microfibers, which um, doesn't, isn't clear, but it's a highly high probability that a lot of those were transported um, through air. The Friends of Casco Bay also did a, a small study and they collected about 30 um, marine samples and they had a slightly lower average in the ocean um, with about half a liter per, uh, sorry, half a piece of plastic per liter of water. In 2016, I joined an expedition mapping microplastics in the Hudson, Hudson River from the headwaters out to Ambrose Light in Long Island Sound. I did this with um, Rosalia Project. We collected 142 samples um, and found 233 microfibers with an average of um, 0.98 microfibers per liter of water. So about one piece per liter. Um, subsequent micro FTIR, which is a, a, a process for doing material characterization to see what type of polymers or materials we were finding, showed that half of the fibers were plastic while the other half were non-plastic but of anthropogenic origin. This uh, is um, a heat map from our publication showing all of the sampling locations and um, the average amount of microplastics found um, at, uh, per liter at each sample location. So unfortunately there was no relationship between fiber abundance, wastewater treatment plant location, or population density. You know, as a scientist, I'm like, oh, it'd be great if we see like, you know, almost no microplastics up at Lake Terre, the clouds, and then it, you know, increases a little bit more as we go down through Albany and, and really, you know, skyrockets when we get into New York City Harbor, but um, uh, none of that happened. Um, There's very random hot spots all along the river. Um, the Hudson River's watershed drainage area contributes an average of what we discovered is 300 million anthropogenic microfibers into the Atlantic Ocean every day. So even though there weren't these nice hot spots uh, in terms of population, it's still a really significant contribution, um, co uh, contributing a significant amount of microfibers into the ocean on a daily basis. Um, a bunch of years ago, I did a small study on plastic contamination in bottled drinking water um, for the nonprofit Story of Stuff. I looked at 19 different brands that people just went to their local supermarkets, pulled off a, a, a bottle of water and shipped it to me. Um, I, uh, of those 18, of those 19 brands, 18 of them contained microplastics. 
uh, particles uh, with an average of eight particles per liter of water. At the same time, a larger international study was being conducted um, with over 250 different um, brands uh, researched in nine different countries. And they also find microplastics in 93% of the bottled water with an average of 10 pieces of plastic per liter. And one brand contained over 10,000 pieces. So uh, bottled water contains about 22 times more plastic than tap water. Another reason not to buy bottled water. So it's throwing a lot of kind of depressing information at you. Um, and uh, so now what? Uh, complex problems <clears throat> often need complex solutions. But maybe this isn't very complicated. <coughs> Excuse me. Plastic is a material that's invented to last forever. And it really can no longer be used to make products intended to be thrown away almost immediately because we know there is no away. So if we make less and use less, then we will have less pollution. And we've begin, begun to see legislation across the world and nation pertaining to single-use plastic reduction, which has been really heartening in this last decade. So here in Maine, as many of you are probably aware, we have a styrofoam ban for um, uh, retail supermarkets. We have a plastic bag ban. And we also um, just enacted a, an extended producer responsibility uh, bill. So uh, I think that's the start. We need to go further. We need to think more about EPR, extended producer responsibility, and circular economy models. Um, uh, circling back around to the EPR bill that we passed, um, it's one of the most robust ones in the country. And uh, the, the gist is that the producers of products will pay into a fund based on the amount and the recyclability of packaging associated with their product. So these funds will then be used to reimburse municipalities for eligible, re eligible recycling and waste management costs and make investments into recycling infrastructure and help Maine citizens understand how to recycle. Um, I don't think recycling is the be all end all, but it's um, that the EPR bill is a really a step in the right direction in putting some of the responsibility on the producers, not just the consumers. Um, the first payments into that fund will, won't start until 2026, though, so it's going to be a little bit of a process to get to that spot. Um, but both, both Washington State and California are also looking at EPR bills, which um, is wonderful. Um, Europe's had EPR bills for uh, a long time, but I think it's a really good way for us to sort of critically analyze our waste production, uh, our plastic production, and, and how we um, manage our waste. So we know that plastic use isn't going to stop tomorrow, but really, we really need to think about upstream solutions because this isn't just a waste management issue. It is a materials and consumption issue. So for us here in Maine, our ocean supports multiple active commercial fisheries and fishing debris is commonly observed. So policies relevant to incentivizing the return of fishing gear be, may be most relevant for, for us um, to reduce our plastic footprint and impact. And generally, uh, local knowledge and long-term monitoring strategies are critical to inform effective local solutions. So in the meantime, um, there are, are a few tools out, out there to help us physically remove plastics from the environment before they enter the ocean. Um, there's not a lot of great solutions for dealing with what's already out there, especially on the microplastic level, but we can try to stop some, some of it before it, it gets out there in the open ocean because that is a, it's a much larger and more expensive thing to try to tackle. So we have trash traps um, uh, in rivers uh, going into lakes. We have Mr. Trash Little um, down in um, Anacostia River in Baltimore, and there's a few um, trash wheels around the country um, and those uh, uh, remove larger pieces of plastic. Uh, we have on the medium scale here in the middle we have the uh, sea bin which I think um, is a wonderful invention. Um, it's basically like a trash bin that you put in and at a marina and it has a little pump and it helps pull some of that larger pieces of plastic um, into it and then you can just change it like you would change a, a bin. Um, and I think you know I know Stonington could benefit from one of those. I think a lot of harbors and marinas here in Maine could as well. Um, 
we have the little uh, waste waste shark. This is like a little uh, surface ROV that you can drive around um, and uh, uh, suck up trash and change it out. Um, and then we also have this U-Design buoy, which is a, a passive microplastic um, trapper that then you also can change out. On the smaller um, scale and uh, more at the at-home scale, we have the Cora Ball. This is a little actually de developed by a Rosalia project after that Hudson River study. Um, it's something that you can throw in your washing machine and it helps um, capture microfibers and dog hair if you have dogs uh, in, in your wash before it gets out in the wastewater. Um, the Guppy Friend, uh, the Guppy Bag is a wonderful, that's a very effective um, tool to use at home for the synthetics that you, you may own. Um, you can put them in this bag and then chain, um, ch pull out the microfiber lint, um, much like your dryer lint. Um, after the wash. And then Filtrol is um, developed by a Canadian company that you actually put into your uh, washing machine um, output uh, pipe and you can change that filter every every half dozen washes or so like but very much like a lint filter um, in your dryer. So these are actions that you can uh, implement and help support, but I think it's ultimately our awareness of the threat of plastic pollution and our actions as constituents and consumers that will help create a future free of plastic pollution. So there is sufficient scientific evidence to begin mitigation now for preventing future sources of plastic pollution and their associated additives. As a scientist, I think that continuing to study population level health effects of plastic interaction with humans and animals is really important, but we need to operate under and implement the precautionary principle now when it comes to plastic. Fortunately, there's growing awareness in many government organizations and in the general populace, you're all here today um, learning more about this, um, of plastic pollution as a threat to our health and the ecosystem. International agreements and national action plans should provide the foundational support for local investigations that lead to implementation of science informed actions relevant in each region. So much of my research shows the importance of local sampling campaigns, informed solutions on the ground and feed into global databases to better understand the issue on a larger scale. And for plastic pollution, I think we need to think globally, collaborate global, globally, regionally and nationally, but really act locally. So thank you so much for listening and I will um, stop sharing my screen, screen and be happy to um, answer any questions. Thanks so much, Abby. Um, there are some questions in the chat box. Um, uh, addressing the question of whether this presentation will be available online later, yes. Um, it will be on the Wells Reserve's YouTube site once we get it transferred over there. Uh, let's see, Linda, can you tell yet if incineration removes the microplastics from circulation? So that's a great question. Um, and incineration has been touted um, mostly by plastic corporations as the solution to plastic pollution. Um, unfortunately, well, this is a, this, that's a big question. Um, uh, in a nutshell, um, I'm going to say I'm really not pro incineration because it um, often is, uh, plastic that is often incinerated. <laughs> Sorry, this is, this could be a whole presentation in and of itself, but um, in short, it doesn't get rid of um, microplastics. We still have um, plastic ash, uh, which is highly, highly toxic. Also, as plastic is burned, it re releases dioxins, and many of the facilities don't have the, enough filtration to prevent that from entering our atmosphere, and dioxins are one of the most toxic sub um, substances known to man. So um, by burning plastic, uh, it doesn't, doesn't incentivize people to change any lifestyle behaviors in terms of how they use plastic, and that's why it's pushed forward by the plastics industry. And I think that's the underlying biggest issue there. Um, it also still, we, you still re end up with some waste and that has, it's really hard to figure out how to dispose of toxic ash in a way that doesn't um, really make its way back into our environment. So I could go on and on about that, but that's, 
um, as in a nutshell, I can, as I can get about incineration, but there's a lot of great resources about there, out there about um, incineration and um, things to think about uh, whether you think it's um, an appropriate way forward for um, getting rid of plastics. All righty, let's see. The next question is from Bill. Uh, what are the main contributors to the projected two to three times increase by 2050? Uh, in terms of plastic companies, um, I, I think that's maybe what he means. Um, I think that uh, some of the biggest plastic companies, um, you know, put forward by the American Chemistry Council, Unilever, Procter and Gamble, Gamble Coca-Cola. Um, I think that uh, looking at some of the um, meetings um, of the plastic producers, it looks like uh, they're really going to start tar targeting Africa for flooding Africa with plastics. Um, they've done a pretty great job of integrating into the economy of Southeast Asia um, for single-use plastic. Um, and so I think they're going to continue to try to pump, pump it into those countries and then really expand into Africa. I'm not sure if that answers your question, but um, that's, I think that's where we're going to see that increase of plastics um, growing. Alrighty, let's see. Matt asks, how long does it take you to filter and score a single one liter water sample? Um, that's a great question as well. And it really, de it really depends. Um, if it's a fresh water sample and it's been sedimenty, it can take a while. Um, I used a vacuum pump filtration. Um, sometimes the water goes right down, um, but if it either has high sediment load or high phytoplankton or zooplankton load, it can be um, anywhere from uh, take anywhere from about 40 seconds to five minutes. Um, and so we started to rate our, the quality of our samples um, just by doing a quick visual assessment. Sometimes we would stretch the um, filtration over multiple filters just to expedite that process. And same with on the microscope side of things. If it was a really dirty sample or had a lot of plastics, it took longer to count and move through that grid. So, um, you know, anywhere maybe from minimum of four to five minutes, if you're really quick, to, uh, you know, a half hour. Great, let's see. Um, DeMarcus asked, what does the present knowledge of microplastic mean for how it is used during manufacturing process or even medical practices? Um, that's a great question. Um, the um, microbead act of 2016 what was Obama's last um, year in office. Um, that was sort of a low hanging fruit because uh, there was enough general knowledge about microbeads and it seemed like an easy way for us to phase that out of our personal care products. Um, unfortunately, uh, and, and a lot of companies got on board with that because they're like, great, this is like a win-win. It looks good in the face of the public. Um, and we can easily take this, you know, plastic additive out of our product. Unfortunately, there were a lot of things that slipped between the cracks or, or found loopholes in that legislation. So there's still a lot of um, leave on products that contain microplastics, not wash off products. Um, also, a lot of pharmaceuticals contain micro microplastics still. So I think that um, on the general populace, population side, there's a lot more awareness of my, microplastics. I think on the production or well, larger corporation production um, that they've been more clever about finding loopholes on how to um, continue to have microplastics in many products. And maybe that's a very pessimistic outlook, but I think um, this research has made me a little bit more cynical. Okay, Karen says, this was fantastic, thank you. I know Five Gyres has educational materials and Rosal Rosalia Project has a student activity for catching and viewing microplastics. Are there any others you know of or could recommend that would be practical for short-term student groups, i.e. half-day field trip groups? Hmm. We use a 20 UM mesh net for student plankton samples. What size would you recommend for micro, mi microplastics? Um, that's, yeah, Five Gyres, um, Rosalia Project, uh, Surfrider, um, the Plastic Pollution Coalition um, has a, a lot of resources. Um, 
and Testing Our Waters, which was developed by Barents Roth at the Pearson School of Design in New York, has a lot of easy DIY, very affordable ways to build little microplastic samplers. Um, uh, 20 micron is great. Um, most um, uh, of the big tone nets you see are 333 micron or um, so a much larger scale. So you would definitely find uh, microplastics in your 20 micron net. Uh, you just have to have a microscope to look at them at down to that size. So um, you could easily do little toe samples um, and that would be the best way to sort of volume reduce your water. Um, so sample a lot of water and not to have to process it in the lab. So um, yeah, little toe samples um, or setting up a um, stationary net in a river or something like that. It's a, another kind of fun and easy way to get an idea of what sort of plastics are in the water. Um, I don't see any other questions, but I have a question, two questions. Um, one, you said that the plastics are congregating in the poles. Is that because of the currents or some other reason? Um, to be determined, I think um, a lot of it is because of the, the glo uh, global conveyor belt of currents. Um, you know, a lot of those come, go up to the polar regions, cool, and then come back uh, down. Um, so yes, I think that a lot um, are transported up there through our current systems um, and then become trapped for a variety of different reasons. Um, the other big piece that we're better understanding is one, the atmospheric transport of microplastics but also um, uh, atmospheric transport of microplastics is then sometimes settling on snow and ice. And since we're seeing unprecedented melting, um, a lot of those plastics that might have been trapped in the ice or snow for a long time are now sort of dumping into the ocean. So that's um, a, another potential source. The other is um, seabirds. So seabirds go out and eat a var variety of different creatures. And if they um, have a colony, um, or, or nest um, in those areas, they're passing through a lot of that plastic. So their guano is another potential source. Thank you. Let's see another question here from Barbara. Do you think bacteria or caterpillars that can digest plastics will be part of the solution for reducing microplastics in the environment? Mm -hmm. um, I've always been so excited when I see things like mealworms and some ugly fungus that um, eat plastic, but Unfortunately, at the uh, volume of plastic that we're dealing with and the volume of plastic that we are producing, uh, none of those are um, at this point applicable to actually making a dent in um, reducing um, uh, or processing plastic waste. I mean, it's just at this point too slow and too small. Um, but I think that, you know, human, human, human ingenuity got us here, so maybe it can get us, uh, get us out of here as well. Um, in terms of dealing with this issue. So um, I, I always continue to get excited about uh, biological ways of um, disposing of plastic. But there's, there's been nothing more, uh, nothing that's really uh, going to change things at this point. Let's see. Um, don't see any other questions. Um, my other question was, oh, here's one. Uh, I'll hold mine. Where can we find student-friendly protocols for monitoring microplastics? I don't see them readily on the Ros Rosalia or Surfrider websites. So the part of the issue with microplastics is that if you're, uh, you know, there's sort of that if you just want to do it for educational purposes and just to get kids thinking about it, um, that's one thing. Um, if you actually want to have data that can be used, um, it's very hard to do on as sort of a school project because of the um, how uh, particularly you have to be about contamination. I mean, you need, um, which is pretty hard to do in a, in a not say impossible, but difficult to do, especially with younger kids, um, because everything needs to be triple rinsed, where your body's positioned um, when you're taking the field sample, no one can be upwind, you have to be wearing natural clothing, ideally. And then if you're going to process it in a laboratory setting, like my lab was a clean lab, um, no one was allowed in or out while we were processing samples. I only wore um, non-synthetic clothing. Um, we would do air, run air blanks um, and field blanks. Uh, so it was actually very involved in terms of making sure that our data was not being skewed by us. Um, but if you want to just have kids 
take some samples and look under a microscope for them to understand um, how how prevalent microplastics are in our environment. Um, there's a few different things you can do. You can do phytoplankton samples and then just use a, um, a slide and look under it, uh, take droplets of, of water from that sample and look under, under a microscope. Um, uh, and you can use a phytoplankton net in a river as well. You'll just have to monitor it for leaves and things like that. So there's that side of things. Also, um, what's it called? Uh, the University of Florida, Maya um, Patterson, uh, sort of adapted my methodology for a larger citizen science um, or a smaller citizen science um, initiative in Florida. Um, and so you can access those protocols and it's a little bit maybe more involved, but you could borrow from those protocols for doing a uh, processing with your, with your students. So taking those grab samples, filtering them in the lab, and then looking at the, the filter under the microscope. I hope that answers your question. Oh, another, another um, again, like sampling water for phytoplankton or things, it's not new science. Um, so you can also borrow other techniques like um, the Department of Marine Resources for their phytoplankton monitoring, net, monitoring network, which I used to be a part of, had a way of uh, reducing bulk water samples, um, basically taking um, PVC pipes and uh, 100 micron or whatever micron mesh you want, stretching it across and making your own little filtration things. Then you would just take a bucket of water and pour it through and then rinse that um, sample, uh, what was left of that sample down into a vial. And that's another really easy way uh, not to get robust data, but for you to look at what microplastics um, might be in your local watershed. I hope that's helpful. Thanks, Abby. We have um, a couple more questions here in the chat uh, from Lisa. Could you speak to the currents that affect the plastics and trash that are left at Midway Atoll, the effect on the seabirds, et cetera? Thanks. Um, I will try to. So that's a little out of my wheelhouse. Um, I'm not an oceanographer. Um, but yeah, where Midway is positioned, I think it's um, near one of the gyres and, uh, and a lot of plastics are transported to that island. I'm sure many of you see, have seen um, Albatross or some of those other films that document um, the plastics there and how it's affecting the wandering Albatross. Um, so um, as we're seeing, um, you know, a lot of the birds that nest on Midway, not only are they nesting in trash, but they're consuming and bringing back so much plastic um, for their um, their chicks. And we found that um, plastics emit an odor to, that is attractive to birds. And that's one of the reasons why, we, you know, for a while people thought it was, oh, the color. And I'm sure some of these things are also triggers, um, but birds are actually attracted to, um, to plastic because of the smells they emit. And so they end up uh, seeking out plastics um, and bringing them back to their chicks, which then they feed the chicks and the chicks end up ultimately starving to death usually because um, they get full of plastic and can't pass it all and uh, have no nutrition or it punctures their, their gut um, and uh, causes them to die. So it's a pretty grim situation out there. Um, and I think that um, that can be applied to a lot of different places in the world where we see uh, seabirds foraging um, in places where the, there seem to be more plastic than food for them. Uh, from Linda, does Maine's recycling actually recycle plastic or do they just sell it overseas? Uh, that's a great question. Um, and now at this point in the pandemic, I, um, I don't know about many of you, but our local transfer station um, stopped recycling anything for about a year. Um, because um, they argued that if all of it was going up to perk and being burned anyhow. Um, so in Maine, I think we're a mixed bag and I don't know what the current situation is. I know that we were sorting and um, truck, uh, selling a lot of our more, the more valuable plastics, uh, like number two, um, but a lot of it was being shipped out of Maine. And I don't know uh, what is happening right now, but I would say that recycling is one of the the biggest lies that has been sold to us as consumers as a, the, doing the right thing for our plastic consumption. Maybe, maybe that's controversial to say, but I think that um, we were always told that, you know, just buy whatever you need. We can, you know, all this plastic can be recycled, but we now know that not only is it very, uh, a lot of it doesn't end up being recycled, um, but that uh, it often is almost always recycled into something that's less less useful and then often landfilled after that because 
of the mix of plasticizers and additives. You know, a plastic bottle will never be a plastic bottle again. So thinking about, uh, thinking less about recycling as a solution and more of um, a way to uh, uh, move plastics along. Well, basically not thinking of recycling as a solution and really um, scrutinizing what, what we buy in plastic and how we can move away from that, I think, um, because it's, it's fraught. And I think in 2018, when China stopped taking our plastic, that really uh, sh shone a light on um, what we're actually doing with a lot of our plastics and, and that recycling, um, a lot of the recycling is a myth. <laughs> Uh, Abby, a question about the birds um, smelling the plastic is, are there any efforts in changing the odor of plastics to help with that problem? Um, that's a good question. I mean, I think a lot of these plastics have been maybe at sea for decades. So um, no, not that I've heard of as a solution for reducing that. Um, and then your slide where you had all the different possible solutions for for plastics, um, where where can we go to find some of those? Um, both at the the one that collected plastics in harbors and oh, Mr. Trash, um, home. and also just the home solutions that you mentioned. Are there specific companies or or websites or um, places you recommend? Uh, there's a lot of uh, nonprofits that focus on sort of gathering this information in a way that you don't have to scourge the internet for it. Um, the Plastic Pollution Coalition has a lot of great resources. Um, the uh, Surf Rider um, also has a lot of um, national Surf Rider, and I'm sure Maine Surf Rider has some. Uh, they have some great fact sheets and and resources and things you can do. Um, well, it's off the top of mind. Uh, Five Gyres has come up, um, and Five Gyres actually has a, a lot of great resources and a lot of great publications about microplastics. Some of my um, slides uh, use some of their. Um, visualizations um and um no I'm, and i know there's a lot out there oh upstream um upstream solutions upstream policy they're actually based here in maine they often have a lot of uh, interesting things about what they're doing on the legislative side of things um so yeah that's a, a place to get you started thank you looks like we have about three minutes for any other burning questions from the group. Um, lots of thank yous coming in here, Abby. Thank you for listening. And um, there's a lot of, a lot, all, I feel like we're just, you know, brushing the surface of a lot of, a lot of these issues in, in ways that we can, as consumers and, and voters, um, change things. Um, but a lot of it is about self-education. Self oh, another great resource is the story of stuff. I, I talked about the bottled water study I did, but they've just uh, won an Emmy for their uh, film called The Story of Plastic, and I think that's free on YouTube, or you can go to their website, and they have all these great education resources. I used to use a lot when I did more teaching um, of the story of microfibers, um, and there's short little um, animated sort of videos with a lot of great facts. Abby, um, one more question here from Alan. I wasn't able to join till late, so this may have been answered. Where is, where is the world in the quest for friendlier alternatives to the use of this ubiquitous material? This is also uh, something I think a lot about, um, and it could be a whole nother presentation. Uh, at this point, I have not seen, it's pretty crazy. We're in 2021, and we really, I have not, yet seen a viable alternative to traditional plastics. Um, I think that R&D is now making way more leaps and bounds, um, mm -hmm. but that there just hasn't been brains and money put towards this um, because plastic is an amazing material. Um, a lot of the bioplastics, I think really need to be, uh, there's a lot of greenwashing that haps, happens around bioplastics. And also, um, as a consumer, it's sometimes really hard to tease out what's happening with bioplastics. You know, it's put forward as it's made from corn or, you know, something that's maybe subsidized by the government, but then it has the same suite of toxic chemicals added into it um, that traditional polymer-based uh, plastics, synthetic polymer-based plastics are. So a lot of them 
um, are not real long-term solutions in terms of um, reducing that toxic legacy um, of plastic. So I know there's something out there. I know that this can we can have the properties of uh, we can have a material that has the properties of plastic that have made it um, the global uh, issue that it is. Um, but um, I have not not yet seen that. So maybe this will be the winter. <laughs> Digging into that, and someone will invent something fantastic. But we're not not there, unfortunately. Maybe you'll invent it. <laughs> I'll put that on my, my list of things to do. <laughs> um, Demarcus, I see your your tech your um, message in the chat, and I will I will convey that to Abby if she doesn't see it. Um, thanks everybody for being here today. Thank thank you thank you to Abby for taking the time with us, and um, hope you all have a great afternoon. Thank you everyone for your interest in tuning in.